Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In module 7 of uh, this course, we are studying about the status of health and education in the context of India. We are also providing a global context to how we understand uh, status of health and education, but more particularly we are focusing on what has been happening within uh, India. Now in this lesson, I want to focus on a very unique experiment and uh, exercise that has been carried out in India since 2005, which is uh, called the Annual State of Education uh, Report that is uh, being provided by uh, the NGO uh, named uh, Pratham and it has become a huge exercise in itself which has addressed the problem of learning crisis in India. So, uh, in this lesson, we will go into some of the details of the ASAR uh, reporting and what are the outcomes of the ASAR report and how it is addressing the problem of uh, uh, differential learning outcomes at the state level as well as at the all India level. So, I have planned today's lesson as follows. First, we will discuss the concept of learning society. Uh, then we will discuss what is learning crisis, what are the components of learning crisis. Learners may recall that in one of the earlier classes, we have also discussed about uh, the global scenario with regard to uh, millions of children uh, not learning even if they are uh, coming to schools on a regular basis. So, we have addressed the issue of learning crisis uh, briefly earlier as well, but in today's uh, lesson, we will contextualize it uh, taking India as an experience. Uh, following this uh, understanding about the components of learning crisis, we will understand what is ASAR, uh, what is the role of ASAR in assessing learning crisis in India and what are the methods and findings of ASAR. So, let me begin with this concept of uh, learning society which is uh, taking shape in international literature currently. This concept of learning society basically views learning as a a continuous process that occurs throughout life uh, beyond formal education and in both formal and informal settings. So, it takes a life cycle approach and is understood to be to mean that learning can happen anytime and anywhere uh, at all stages of life and through various channels within the economy and society. Various economists such as Joseph Stiglitz and Bruce Greenwald have also argued that creating a learning society should be a key economic policy goal as it leads to a more productive economy and improved living standards. Now, in the context of learning, it is helpful to look at two domains of learning. One is learning for life, which uh, wherein it focuses on developing individuals into effective members of families and communities uh, and so on. And the second is uh, learning for work, which involves skill development for employability requiring adaptation as labor markets evolve. So, in the context of learning, there has been an equivalent focus, uh, there has been an uh, excessive focus on learning for work in various country contexts, but uh, learning for life has not received as much attention as it should. Uh, but the concept of learning society is sort of trying to integrate both of these concepts of learning for life and learning for work uh, in the domains of learning. Now, there is a distinction of learning from education. Learning is basically a broader concept than education uh, because it encompasses acquisition of knowledge, skills, attitudes and values in a wider social context and across all life stages and contexts. Uh, needless to say, it also has impact on socioeconomic development because we know that education and human capital development are crucial for growth and socioeconomic progresses. Uh, there are differences in cognitive skills as we have seen in the earlier classes also based upon the various standardization test scores that there is an emphasis on it explaining long term economic growth disparities across countries. We have seen that most the story of uh, the growth story of most countries across the world is a, a story of differences in knowledge societies. So, knowledge society has uh, emerged as one of the important drivers of economic growth. There are broader benefits of learning obviously because it is linked to various benefits such as health, governance and to ensuring that the individual's full potential is realized by as citizens, leaders, workers and entrepreneurs. So, the concept of learning society basically is a very uh, comprehensive and holistic understanding of how societies progress uh, by ensuring that learning continues based upon a life cycle approach 
all throughout their uh, life stages. Now, what are the roles of a learning society? Uh, first is you know inclusive learning society. Basically, an effective learning society promotes lifelong learning for all individuals regardless of age, gender, race, socioeconomic status or work status and through in various forms. There are diverse stakeholders involved uh, as far as the roles of a learning society is concerned because here we are not just talking about the role of the public sector but also the private sector including NGOs, local communities and various interest groups who all play essential roles in promoting learning, creativity and innovation as far as the learning society is concerned. The role of learning society is also to meet the global education goals, ensuring quality and relevance in education, promoting lifelong learning opportunities which are all central to the sustainable development goal agenda. Uh, the learning society should also be uh, adaptable to change because in a rapidly changing world, a learning society must be adaptive and flexible, particularly in response to disruptive technologies and evolving societal needs. Technology is also reshaping education and training, especially for the millennials and uh, it influences how learning is delivered and consumed. There is an uh, important role of skills for the future that a role of a learning society encompasses because learning societies need to equip individuals with the skills to navigate the fourth industrial revolution, online learning, new technical domains and the challenges of an aging workforce. COVID-19 has provided us many lessons as to the role of a learning society because the pandemic highlighted the importance of uh, diverse channels of education and training and reinforced the need for a resilient and adaptive uh, learning society. Uh, now, in all of these, the role of the community cannot be overemphasized because a learning society requires the involvement of parents, communities, civil service organizations and local bodies which are crucial for maintaining learning continuity and especially in the face of various kinds of disruptions. Now, I want to uh, show this uh, figure on uh, what are the main features of a learning society. A few scholars have worked on an integrated system of what constitutes a learning society. So, the core concept here is that uh, the central focus is on individuals and group learning throughout the lifespan, emphasizing that learning is a continuous process that occurs at all stages of life. And there are various uh, learning modalities. This figure highlights that learning happens through uh, various uh, uh, modalities, formal and non-formal and informal across different sectors of society and the economy. So, some of the key sectors involved are uh, the physical systems uh, which includes formal education institutions like schools and universities, uh, informal and uh, community training infrastructures. Uh, with regard to health systems, the social determinants of health uh, which influence learning outcomes. Uh, if you look at the governance systems, the governance systems promote gender equality, ethnic equality and integration of indigenous knowledge. Then there are digital systems uh, which uh, requires online and blended learning, uh, digital media and job placement platforms. Uh, then there is a focus on uh, democratizing digital learning and creating inclusive opportunities. There is also environmental sustainability wherein education focuses on sustainable development, climate change, uh, food security and well-being. Now, all of these create a learning environment. So, if you see the school system from KG to 12 provides foundational learning and skills. Then you have tertiary education system uh, which further develops skills and knowledge for specialized field. Then we enter workplaces uh, which serve as environments for continuous learning and skill development. Then there are communities, families and faith communities uh, which are informal learning settings that reinforce social values and collective knowledge. Then there are cultural systems uh, which includes museums, libraries, art galleries and uh, sports which provide diverse learning experiences. Then we have mass media which includes traditional media, media on demand and social media which play a role in disseminating information and facilitating learning. Now, there is an interconnectedness of the entire figure because this figure underscores the importance of collaboration and partnerships between different places, 
sectors, networks to build bridges that support learning across the society. So, a learning society is a comprehensive whole which includes different pillars of society uh, such that uh, there are different influences and uh, from the diverse platforms that leads to uh, continuous learning. Now, in this context, I would also like to highlight on uh, UNESCO's Institute for Life Learning which can provide various materials to learners as to uh, how to uh, utilize uh, this uh, knowledge in your uh, research on uh, economics of education. So, UNESCO's Institute for Life Learning is basically a specialized institution within uh, UNESCO that focuses on promoting lifelong learning. It established in 1952 in Germany and the key activities include uh, various uh, uh, diverse aspects, but some of uh, the ones that can be highlighted are research and knowledge sharing. Uh, the UNESCO Institute conducts research on lifelong learning practices, uh, policies and trends providing insights and recommendations to policy makers and practitioners. Uh, there are capacity building activities because there are trainings and capacity building programs for educators and policy makers. Uh, it engages itself in a lot of advocacy by advocating for recognition of lifelong learning as a key strategy for achieving sustainable development. Uh, then there are various global networks uh, that the UNESCO Institute uh, supports and coordinates such as the Global Network of Learning Cities, uh, which encourages cities worldwide to promote inclusive and sustainable learning environments. There are of course various publications and resource materials that uh, this institute uh, puts forth uh, and there are reports, policy briefs and guidelines which are disseminating knowledge and best practices in lifelong learning. I have provided the link to the website on this slide here. So, if you are interested, you can visit this uh, website to get more information and be further informed about uh, the lifelong learning processes. And this is particularly important for practitioners in the field of economics of education who might want to utilize some of these resources on the field. So, having understood this uh, basic uh, idea about uh, what is a learning society, let us now come to a more uh, uh, focused area of learning crisis because uh, we understand that while enrollments have been increasing, attendance in educational institutions have been increasing, but there seems to be a persistent learning crisis. Uh, in uh, societies and this is not just true of developing countries, but also of the developed countries. But since we are mostly discussing within the context of developing countries, it is helpful to focus on the issues of developing countries such as India. So, what is learning crisis that we are referring to? This term learning crisis basically refers to a global situation where despite increased access to education, a significant number of children and young people are not acquiring fundamental uh, skills such as literacy, numeracy and critical thinking. And this crisis highlights a disparity between schooling and actual learning outcomes. So, what are the basic features of learning crisis? First is that uh, there are low learning outcomes despite schooling. Uh, which means that there is illiteracy and innumeracy despite school enrollments rising. Um, many children are attending school, but they are failing to attain basic literacy and numeracy skills. For example, UNESCO has estimated that about 617 million children and adolescents worldwide are not achieving the minimum proficiency levels in reading and mathematics. Uh, then there is inequitable access and quality, which is a source of learning crisis because there are children from marginalized communities, low income families and conflict affected areas who are being disproportionately affected with regard to learning outcomes. Uh, there are gender gaps, girls are more likely to be out of school and less likely to achieve key proficiency in key subjects. Although experience also tells us that when in school, girls seems to be outperforming the boys both in primary classes as well as secondary schooling. When we talk about learning crisis, we also talk about poor quality of education, particularly in the context of untrained teachers, inadequate learning materials and overcrowded classrooms. There is a lack of uh, motivated teachers that contribute to effective teaching. Uh, there is insufficient or outdated textbooks and these um, lack of resources hinder effective learning. Uh, there are high student to teacher ratios which make personalized attention challenging uh, resulting in poor quality of education. 
Similarly, with regard to out of school children, now while enrollments have been increasing, we have seen that in many country cases, attendance have not been increasing. Uh, consistent attendance remains uh, an issue leading to gaps in learning. Uh, there is of course the uh, age old problem of dropouts because of economic pressures, uh, child labour, early marriages and other socio-cultural factors uh, particularly in secondary education these days. Although enrollments in primary education seems to have uh, surpassed all other achievements, uh, secondary education continues to be a lag area. There is also a lack of relevant curriculum, we have seen earlier that uh, pedagogical rules or uh, not teaching at the right level is one of the important uh, uh, reasons of uh, learning losses. So, uh, there are uh, outdated content uh, is another reason, the failure to incorporate uh, critical uh, contemporary skills like digital literacy, problem solving and creativity. Uh, the curriculum is often not designed to align with the students cultural context uh, or future job markets uh, which is an important uh, difficulty. Then of course, there are impacts of conflicts and crisis which disrupts education, wars, natural disasters and pandemics like the COVID-19 have caused prolonged school closures uh, which further intensifies the problem of learning crisis. Uh, there are assessment gaps, uh, a lot of focus uh, is on assessing the learning crisis, there are inadequate measurements uh, that are uh, being uh, implemented and there are uh, many of the measurements are also not comparable. So, many education systems lack robust mechanisms to assess and monitor learning outcomes effectively. And all of these contribute to uh, economic, uh, has economic implications because poor education quality leads to a less skilled workforce and thus impacts national economic growth and it also gives rise to an intergenerational cycle of poverty because without proper education children are more likely to remain in poverty and perpetuating the cycles across generations. So far what we have understood is the concept of a learning society and what are the basic features of a learning crisis. Now it is in this context that we need to understand the annual survey of education reports of India. The annual survey of education report has been a tremendous success in the context of India and because of its success it has been replicated in many countries across the world. Now uh, before I can begin with the methods of the survey and the outcomes of the survey, let me also point out that there is a, a difference between although the, uh, the uh, report is a serial publication and it has been providing us information about learning crisis in India right from 2005 onwards, it is not an official data source. It is a citizen led survey in India and one of the most successful citizen led surveys in India. Uh, before I can move further, let me also point out five key differences between ASAR which is the annual status of education report and official statistics in India. So, first difference is citizen led versus government led. ASAR is a citizen led initiative. Uh, which means it is uh, carried on by different NGOs, civil society organization. Over time, there is of course involvement of uh, various sections of the of governance structures also which we will discuss, but primarily it is a private citizen led survey in India. Uh, whereas official statistics are typically gathered by government agencies like the Census of India or the National Sample Survey Organization or today which is known as the National Statistics Office. Uh, with regard to frequency and timeliness, ASAR is conducted annually, currently we get biennial reports also uh, providing us more up to date data, but official statistics may be released less frequently and with longer delays. With regard to focus and scope, ASAR specifically focuses on basic learning outcomes and schooling status of children, uh, but official statistics cover a broad range of educational indicators and socioeconomic data. The sampling methodology ASAR uses a very simple village based sampling method that emphasizes reaching every district, but official surveys are often more complex and use stratified sampling techniques. And uh, because this is a citizen led survey, ASAR actively involves local volunteers in data collection, enhancing community engagement but official statistics are largely collected by trained government enumerators. So, it is important to bear in mind that while ASAR is widely accepted, the learning outcomes uh, data that we get from ASAR are highly uh, cited in various government reports as well as in uh, scholarly uh, 
uh, writings, we must understand that ASSER is not an official statistics uh, uh, survey, it is a citizen led survey in India. Now, with this introduction, uh, I want to uh, focus on the core idea behind how ASSER began uh, by quoting this from uh, one of the reports that by 2004, India was well on its way towards achieving universal primary school enrollment. Now, at least the learners of this course must understand that uh, in the middle of the 2000s, we were uh, talking about millennium development goals. Today, we are talking about sustainable development goals. Towards the end of the 1990s and the early 2000s, there was a lot of focus on ensuring that children go to schools. So, the focus was on increasing enrollments. And it is during this time that we were not talking about learning crisis really, we were not talking about learning outcomes, but we were largely talking about input indicators. We were talking about whether children are going to schools or not, whether teachers are available or not, whether resources are being spent on schools or not, whether schools are available or not. These were the questions that occupied the minds of scholars and practitioners. So, it is during this time that the vision of uh, understanding learning crisis began and that I want to underline as one of the important contributions of uh, the team that visualized about the annual status of education report. So, by 2004, India was well on its way to uh, achieving universal primary school enrollment, but there was no information available on the scale about the outcomes of primary education. Children were in school, but were they learning? So, Prathams, uh, the uh, NGO's experience working with children across the country suggested that this was not the case. And therefore, the core of the survey consists of reading and math assessments in collaboration with partner organizations in every rural district of India. The survey team really hammered on the most important uh, uh, learning crisis in Indian schools with regard to reading, comprehension and basic mathematics ability. So, let us try to understand what is ASSER. ASSER is basically the annual status of education report. Earlier it was an annual report, but these days we have biennial reports and these are brought out by Pratham, which is a premier NGO that works in the field of education in India. And the ASSER reports reveal basic literacy, numeracy and English competencies of children in the age group of 5 to 16 that are considered appropriate learning levels for a student of standard 2 or class 2 along with learning levels for class 1 and 3 depending on whether the child possesses learning levels appropriate for class 2. So, basically the ASSER report is trying to assess whether children in uh, class 2 and 3 are able to read the text and carry out basic mathematical operations that they should be able to do at their appropriate levels. So, uh, ASSER reports primarily reveal what percentage of children in the districts and states of India can read a simple paragraph, sentence, word, etc., do simple subtraction and division and read and understand very basic and simple English along with other indicators that uh, change between the reports that have been released since 2005 onwards. Now, because of the simplicity of the indicators uh, revealed in ASSER reports as well as their immediate gravity to stakeholders such as parents, teachers and government officials, ASSER reports have gained unparalleled prominence in the field of education in India because parents who send children to school are often interested to know whether their children have started learning how to read and write and do they have simple arithmetic ability or not. And much of the uh, official statistics that uh, were uh, coming out on education outcomes particularly with regard to enrollment rates or attendance rates or availability of infrastructure facilities in schools and so on did not provide much input to parents who were sending children to school with regard to what their children are learning in schools. So, it is in that sense that this report gained a prominence in the field of education in India and grabbed the attention of various stakeholders primarily among them being parents. So, ASSER took a shape of a movement in itself and uh, it helped uh, to catapult the concept of learning outcomes to the education discourse 
at a time when there was complacency due to increasing enrollment in schools in India because there was a general understanding that enrollments in schools are increasing and therefore probably education achievements in uh, India are increasing and therefore we are going to have a more educated workforce and so on. But then the within the discourse of education in India the idea about a learning crisis and whether or not learning outcomes are being captured effectively or not uh, started taking uh, place because of this initiative. So, Asar looked at whether children were gaining anything by being in school, how much were they gaining and who was being left behind. And they helped to bring the focus to who was being left behind in schools at a time when people were only thinking of who was being left out of schools because we were thinking more about dropouts or who are not being able to reach school. But uh, the question about after having come to schools. Uh, who are being left behind because of learning losses or the learning crisis. So, Asar uh, within a short span of time uh, started uh, being taken very seriously by the central and state governments in India because it provided a no nonsense view on the state of education and the learning crisis down to the district level. So, uh, while uh, we talk about learning crisis at the all India level or at the state level, uh, for the first time we had reports which were talking about learning crisis that is affecting the districts as well as the villages as we will see. So, Asar reports have been cited in major government of India documents like the 11th and 12th 5 year plans and the economic survey of India, Niti Aayog's 3 year action agenda uh, as well as the World Bank's World Development Report 2018. And uh, as I was saying that Asar's impact has crossed national borders as its uh, low cost simplicity of tools and rigor of sampling methodology has been utilized by various other networks and countries. The People's Action for Learning a network uses uh, Asar's methodology and coordinates similar surveys in 15 countries around the world including Uganda, Mexico and Pakistan. And Asar and Asar like initiatives are also mentioned in the Global Education Monitoring Report by UNESCO and the Learning Metrics Task Force by UNESCO and Brookings Institution. So, I want to underline the fact that uh, uh, an initiative which began in the slums of uh, India and which making humble beginnings in 2005 has actually become a very uh, big force in trying to uh, revolutionize the idea of how to capture learning losses or learning crisis in education contexts across the world. Let us uh, lay some uh, focus on the background of Asar. It basically started in Bombay uh, in 1995 uh, to provide preschool education to children in the slums of Bombay, currently Mumbai. Uh, it was uh, uh, the one of the early experiments uh, that uh, the NGO started was the Bal Sakhi program which was being run for learning support of young children in Mumbai and Baroda for children who were being left behind in municipal schools uh, and who lacked basic literacy and numeracy skills needed to participate in classrooms. So, a randomized control trial was started to test the efficacy of the program, the Bal Sakhi program. But the standardized tests resembling normal school tests were used and they did not yield the kind of insights that were sought. So, then things were restarted from scratch and a new set of benchmarks were created to see what children could do or not do in terms of literacy and numeracy in relation to what they should know at or slightly above the age of 8 such as reading a simple sentence and comprehending it working backwards, learning the numbers backwards, the achievements needed to do that were recognized like knowing words and letters and so on. And this was the inception of the Asar tool. This tool was made to identify at which stage of achieving foundational literacy and numeracy a child was at uh, reading a letter, a word, a sentence, a short paragraph or a short story. And uh, this tool was a single sheet of paper with four levels of text, letters, uh, simple and complex words, a short four line paragraph with every sentences and a longer text with more complex vocabulary. So, after testing children with this tool, uh, they were then taught at the level at which they were at and not according to their grade or age. So, while this tool was developed for internal discussion among the uh, instructors at the Bal Sakhi program. It began to be used to quote the learning achievements and current learning stage of each child to their parents and regular school teachers. 
so for example, a fictitious child uh, Rani was asked to read simple sentences and uh, she was uh, asked to read complex sentences which reflected a short story and then uh, the quoted indicators, uh, the conclusions were uh, sounded as uh, such as Rani can read a simple sentence but she has difficulty reading a short story. So, this made a lot of sense to concerned parents and were also helpful to teachers who could then mold their teaching activities according to the need uh, revealed by them. And soon this tool was being used in villages for preparing village report cards as uh, Pratham, the NGO expanded its coverage into rural regions of India. Uh, social workers, educationists and village volunteers went door to door assessing every child themselves and the report card would then be discussed at the panchayat meeting uh, through the village report card. Uh, measurements such as how many children from class 5 in our village can read a class 2 level text began to be used and discussed at the village level. And this kind of an experiment went on from 2001 to 2005 during which the survey method was streamlined and then local organizations were liaised with uh, by Pratham for carrying out these surveys. So, before the first uh, report release in 2005, uh, there were a lot of ground experiments that took place over a period of 10 years or so starting from the experiments carried out at the slums level to different methods of being able to um, measure the uh, um, learning outcomes at the school level. Now, in the first year, the first ASAR report came out in 2005 and uh, the survey was carried out in 475 rural districts and in the first survey a maths assessment was also added to the reading assessment. So, there was reading assessment and arithmetic assessment. A household questionnaire was developed and a sampling methodology was designed and discussed with uh, having taken consultations from statisticians at the Indian Statistical Institute and other experienced technocrats. Altogether, uh, 335,000 odd children were surveyed from 192,000 households in 9,593 villages. So, children were tested in their households on a Sunday instead at a school. So, this is a household based survey while information was taken from schools on Saturdays. Information from the households regarding children was collected on Sundays where uh, most household members including children were found to be in at homes. Uh, so, children were tested in their households on a Sunday instead of at school since teachers might get the better performing children to do the tests and because data on out of school children could not be obtained in schools. In the same year, the then Ministry of Human Resource Development did an enrollment survey and the enrollment rates produced in the survey mirrored the numbers produced based upon the sampling of the ASAR report itself and thus the ASAR was given some credibility. Uh, the annual status of education report started gaining credibility as it matched the enrollment rates uh, based upon the survey carried out by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. Now, ASAR reports also upset many prevalent impressions in its very first year 2005 which uh, underlined the importance of such kinds of surveys. Uh, it especially exposed uh, some of the uh, well laid out conclusions. For example, supposedly well to do states like Tamil Nadu that were hailed for their strides in elementary education were also leaving students behind in classrooms despite seemingly better investments in education. Uh, in a later class, I will talk about the public report in basic education, the probe reports which also uh, sort of uh, helped us in uh, radically changing the way we understood about education in India. And uh, it is then that these kinds of estimates will start making more sense to you with regard to why we had hailed southern states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala as some of the best performing states. But even these states despite increased investments were leaving children behind in classrooms. In Kerala too, the first ASAR survey found that 37 percent of government primary schools and 25 percent of upper primary schools had no teachers when visited by the survey team. So, these revelations upset established notions of ideal states and transformed the discourse of what works and what does not work in school education. 
State governments then began to ask Assad to help them carry out their own internal department evaluations. States like Chhattisgarh commissioned their own Assad studies and helped them double their sample size to get more reliable district level estimates. In 2008, the Assar Center was set up to conduct uh, annual Assar surveys and the Assar Center worked as an independent unit within Pratham that generated timely and independent data on educational outcomes in districts, created supporting research and developed training capacities for annual surveys. Now let us focus on the design uh, and the sampling procedure of the Assar surveys. The uh, design of the Assar survey has changed every year from 2005 to 2022, uh, but the core components related to basic reading and arithmetic learning outcomes have remained unchanged. For Assar surveys, 30 randomly chosen villages are surveyed in every rural district in India. And in each of these villages, 20 households are chosen at random in a sampling method that accounts for any possible household sampling biases. And accordingly then uh, 30 multiplied by 20 you get a sample size of about 600 in each district and this number allows us to have statistically reliable district level estimates. The villages are then chosen from the latest uh, census survey listing of villages. Now with the uh, lack of census data there are some of the problems with these kinds of surveys uh, also. Uh, a, a unique uh, procedure of the Assar survey was that every year 10 villages from the previous year samples were removed from the sample and 10 new villages were added to the sample. So this allowed for greater comparability across years. And there are three components in the Assar survey. One is the village information that is to be collected. Second is the household survey which is the most important uh, component of the Assar reports which focuses on learning outcomes component. And finally, a school visit, uh, which is the third component. So, how does the village information and household survey uh, collection of data takes place? Uh, so, a team of two volunteers who will carry out the survey, visit the sample villages and contact the Sarpanj, to whom they explain the purpose of their visit and the Assar survey process. With due permission, then they explore the whole village and mark out different zones or hamlets within the village to randomly sample uh, households from each zone or hamlet. Then they use the rule of five, meaning that they choose every fifth household beginning from the middle of each zone or hamlet and then include them in their household sample as long as the household is present and willing to participate in the survey. Then basic information about the household such as assets, household structure or type, availability of electricity and toilets etc. is gathered and often the educational background of the mother and father are also collected. The learning outcome tool to be administered uh, to at children of the households during the household survey consists of two permanent components, the reading assessment and the arithmetic assessment. Other components of the learning outcomes tool come and go every few years such as English reading and comprehension, uh, knowing how to read a clock, household mathematical calculations, etc. But the unique and consistent components are the reading and arithmetic assessments. The school visit component includes visiting the uh, largest school in the village with elementary classes and observing which right to education entitlements and standards the school has met and which are yet to be met such as toilets, taps, boundary walls, pakka walls, electricity, etc. along with teaching learning material, charts, posters, libraries, office come storeroom, etc. So, the point of looking at all of this information is to highlight the extensive information that is collected as part of this citizen led survey which has led to such a uh, to addressing learning outcomes and learning crisis in India. The total enrollment in these schools is recorded along with the number of students present on the day of the school visit on that day and the total number of teachers appointed along with the number of teachers present at the school on the day of the visit are also recorded. So, this slide is to show you the assert when uh, survey calendar, uh, it begins from April to May where tool development takes place, the assessment tools are created and then adapted to 19 languages, pilots are uh, carried out uh, at various district level to understand the processes and the tools. Uh, between June and July recruitments of state teams take place who travel within their states to mobilize partners and recruit master trainers. 
In August, various national workshops take place where the ASAR central and state teams uh, train uh, the master trainers on ASAR survey processes. Uh, then there are in September, between September and November, state level trainings, district level trainings and monitoring takes place uh, where the state teams train master trainers in every state. The master trainers then train volunteers in every district and the survey is supervised in selected villages by master trainers or ASAR state teams. Call centers are also established where the ASAR state teams monitor the survey via frequent calls to master trainers. Then there are district rechecks, uh, the state team also rechecks the field uh, data in selected districts and villages. Uh, between November and December, the ASAR center recheck takes place where the central and state teams conduct interstate field rechecks. Then there is data entry and analysis and in January, the final report is released. So, there are various uh, levels of checkings and uh, creation of tools that the ASAR center pays attention to which has led to such uh, robust data on uh, learning outcomes and assessing the learning crisis. So, this is just to give the organizational hierarchy. There is an ASAR central team which designs the survey, develop tools for assessment and adapt to different languages. Uh, national workshops are held, they coordinate interstate field checks and collect and analyze the survey data. The state teams mobilize and recruit trainers, uh, they monitor and supervise village surveys in their states via the state call centers. They conduct survey rechecks in many districts and villages. Uh, then there are master trainers uh, who train volunteers in every district for survey. They monitor all and supervise some of the village surveys in their districts and they conduct survey rechecks. And then finally, there are village survey volunteers who conduct the actual survey at the village and household levels in the designated sample villages. And there are two volunteers who are assigned to each village. So, it is a massive exercise including human resource at various levels and of course, it requires partnerships with various organizations including various levels of governance uh, at the state and district level. Now, one of the very welcome developments in ASAR surveys has been the involvement of diets, which are the district institutes for education training. In the policy class, you have seen that these diets were established after the 1986 National Policy on Education as a center for training teachers and monitoring and enhancing their teaching skills. Now, these diet students who are typically trainee teachers and who are pursuing a diploma in elementary education constitute the single largest pool of ASAR volunteers today. And when they participate in these ASAR surveys, it opens their eyes to the educational realities of their regions and realigns their pedagogical philosophy to the needs of the children. So, it is to highlight here that the volunteers, the surveyors who are participating in these ASAR surveys are also teachers who take the experiences from the field surveys back to their education and hopefully uh, implement them in their future work as uh, teachers in uh, different schools. So, uh, it has also been found that district surveys in which the help of uh, the district institutes for education training has been taken, they have wrapped up the surveys quicker because it takes no more than two weeks to finish the district survey. So, which means that these surveys are also creating a group of uh, skilled workforce who are trained in the education realities of the country. Uh, these diets also provide the physical infrastructure and the logistics required to conduct the survey. So, this coordination between the government and ASAR is a rare example of a successful mutual learning experience. Now, if you look at this map here, all the reds uh, show the involvement of the District Institute of Education and Training. The blues are the partnerships that are carried out by colleges and universities. The greens are by the NGOs and then there are others and multiple partner types in different parts of the city. But ASAR service today cover almost the entire length and breadth of the country. Now, this one is to, this slide is to uh, introduce you to some of the uh, reading tasks that are uh, sampled, that are uh, provided as tools for understanding reading and comprehension. So, for example, uh, a level 1 easy paragraph, here the instruction that is provided is uh, that the surveyor would uh, point to one of the easy paragraphs and ask the child to read the easy paragraph. So, the child may read slowly. Uh, she may stop frequently, 
she may make three or four mistakes in not reading words correctly but as long as the child reads the text like she is reading a sentence she will then be categorized as a child who can read easy paragraphs and this level is also called level 1 uh, in uh, level 2 Uh, the child is shown a story if she can read fluently with ease and reads like she is reading a long text then she is marked as a story child and it is marked that this child can read uh, level 2 texts uh, if she is unable to read the story fluently and stops a lot she will be marked as a paragraph child which means that the child can read only level 1 text uh, similarly for uh, doing words Uh, a child is asked to read any five words from the word list and uh, the child is allowed to choose the words herself if she can correctly read at least four out of the five words with ease then she is asked to try to read the easy paragraph again and if she is able to do this then it she is marked as a word category child if she can correctly and comfortably read words but is still struggling with the uh, easy paragraph or the level 1 paragraph and if she cannot correctly read at least four out of the five words she chooses then she is shown the list of letters and then the child is asked to read any five letters from the letter list uh, and she chooses herself if she can correctly recognize at least four out of five letters the, then the words are shown to her again uh, she will be marked as a letter child if she can read four out of five letters but cannot read words but if not then she is uh, marked as a child who cannot even recognize letters and this is done for across different languages across the state of india because india of course has multilingual levels of education and uh, this uh, process gives us an idea about what is the level at which a child of any grade can read similarly the test uh, carried out for arithmetic so uh, then the question is the fictitious child rani can she do arithmetic so here uh, for subtraction a two digit uh, with borrowing uh, here the child is pointed out to any one of the subtraction sums from the sample tool and the child is asked what the numbers are for example uh, there is a number 56 if the child says 5 and 6 instead of 56 then she is asked again to say what the number is when the numbers are together Uh, so the surveyor points out to the minus sign and asks what do you have to do now once uh, it is established that the child correctly recognizes the numbers uh, the surveyor is showing then uh, she is asked to write and solve the problem she is given a choice of another similar problem from the sums on the page and then it is observed whether the child can solve the problem or not if she cannot correctly do the subtraction problem then she is given a number recognition task if she does both the subtraction problems correctly then she is given a division problem now if she cannot correctly do the subtraction problems then she is given a number recognition task uh, it is pointed out by the surveyors to recognize uh, one by one to at least five numbers if she can correctly identify at least four out of five numbers then the child is marked as someone who can recognize numbers and if not then the child is marked as who cannot even recognize numbers now in the context of division uh, with regard to children who have correctly uh, been able to solve the subtraction problems the child is shown a division problem she then chooses one to try and she is asked to tell what the problem is and what she has to do now she is then asked to write and solve the problem it is then observed what the child does if she is able to correctly solve the problem then she is marked as a division child if she is unable to do one problem then she is given another problem from the sheet and if she is unable to solve any division problem correctly then she is marked as a child who can do subtraction so these are the details with which the arithmetic and comprehension ability of children are assessed using the tools simple tools of arithmetic and reading and comprehension developed by the assert team so reading arithmetic and now english reading and comprehension tests are administered for all children aged 5 to 16 years and the tests match learning levels appropriate for someone studying in class 2 now here i have put together a few materials for the state of assam because assert surveys give out state reports as well based upon the household survey results 
so this is uh, analysis based on data of households at the 26 out of 27 uh, districts uh, for which data is available uh, from ASAR 2022. So you can see that uh, uh, between age 6 to 14. 71.9% uh, are enrolled in government schools, 26% in private schools and uh, between government schools and private schools you would see that the enrollments in private schools are increasing over the years as this chart will show you here between 2006 and 2022 this is the trends of children in government schools. So the enrollments in government schools have been coming down and if you look at the time data you will see that the enrollments in private schools are uh, rising. This also brings to focus, uh, there is a lot of uh, research now on um, private schools, kinds of private schools, are they necessarily high paying private schools or low fee private schools and what is the policy framework within which these low fee private schools are functioning and so on. It is a matter of different uh, uh, kind of research but uh, an important one in the context of education in India and developing countries. If you look at the trends over time, enrollments have been increasing. This chart here shows us percentage of children not enrolled in school by age groups and by sex. So the numbers not enrolled are declining which means enrollments have been rising. Here if you see this table shows us percentage children enrolled in different types of preschools and schools by age. So this tells us by age 3, 4 till 8 onwards whether they are in Anganwadi's, government pre-primary schools, uh, private LKG, UKG. So you will see that even at the preschool level at ages 4 to 6 the enrollments in private schools are comparatively higher when compared to the government schools. Then there are schools by uh, these age you will see that uh, from ages 3 to 8 the school enrollments are let us say at age 3.4 uh, and also at ages 7 and 8 the numbers are uh, the percentages are very small 21 percent and 23 percent. Children enrolled in different types of preschools and schools also uh, this is the data for 2022 and you will see that the Anganwadi enrollments for example has increased from 70 percent to 80 percent uh, by age 4 68 percent to 71 percent and so on. Uh, similarly, you can look at uh, the information on preschool enrollments in government pre-primary schools, private pre-primary schools and so on. Uh, now this one here, uh, so this is how the tables in ASAR reports look like which are uh, learning assessments. Uh, so here uh, for example in table uh, 4 here percentage children by grade and reading level. So in standard 1 this one says that 37 percent cannot even read a letter. In standard 2, 20 percent cannot even read a letter. Uh, now, uh, if you look at uh, this uh, column here, uh, this one tells us that by grade 3, only 15 percent can read level 1 text, the simple paragraphs, 17 percent can read uh, standard 2 text. So, if a child in grade 3 cannot even read uh, standard 2 text and standard 1 text and the numbers are so low that tells us about how many children are being left behind even in class 3. Similarly, you see for class 4 only 20 percent can read level 1 text, 26 percent can read level 2 text. If you go up to class 8 only 14 percent can read standard 1 level text and only 68 percent can read standard 2 level text. So this gives us a sense of how many children are left behind in elementary schools and primary schools going up to the secondary level. So which is why there is a crisis at the secondary schooling level today. Although enrollments have increased, attendances have increased, the reading and comprehension levels have not increased which is leading to a learning crisis. Similarly, there are trends over time. So let us say between 2012 and 2022 percentage children in standard 3 who can read standard 2 level text uh, in government schools it has more or less uh, remained the same between 2012 and 2022. You see that there was a rise between 2012 and 2018 number of children who could read had risen between 10 percent to 14 percent but in 22. Uh, it is uh, 10 percent which, which could likely be the impact of COVID-19 and the disruptions that we saw in schools. In private schools the percentage children in standard 3 who can read standard 2 level text are relatively much higher 
uh, but even here there are children who are being left behind you would see that the numbers are between 32 percent and 38 percent between 12 and 2022. So, this is how we can understand about uh, the uh, severity of the problem in our uh, schooling system whether it is government schools or private schools. Similarly, for arithmetic ability uh, if you see here that in class 1 in 2022 30 percent of children could not even recognize the numbers from 1 to 9. In class 3, 7 percent children could not recognize numbers 1 to 9 and in class 7, 2 percent of children could not even recognize the numbers 1 to 9. And then we see the columns where uh, they can recognize the numbers between 1 to 9. So, in class 3, only 35 percent children could recognize the numbers between 1 to 9 and 32 percent uh, children could recognize the numbers between 11 to 99 and so on. And similarly, we have data for about who can subtract, who can conduct division in schools. This figure will show uh, for example, in class 8, 35 percent students knew how to subtract and 27 percent knew how to divide. So, this again tells us the severity of the problem of learning crisis with regard to reading and arithmetic abilities. Uh, similarly, we have details about reading and comprehension in English. There are uh, different state reports available that can give us what is the severity of the problem. There are also observations uh, from schools as we mentioned that there is a school survey as well. So, that tells us about how many schools have been visited over time. Uh, it tells us about the percentage of enrollments, the percentage of teachers present. Um, then schools where standard 2 children were observed sitting with any other standard, uh, where standard 4 children were observed sitting with any other standard. Uh, then there are trends over time for percentage of schools with total enrollment of 60 or less with regard to primary schools, upper primary schools and so on. Schooling facilities data is also provided by these reports. We have data on midday meal schemes, drinking water, toilet, girls toilet, library, electricity, computer facilities and so on. Uh, there are other school uh, indicators for example, whether weekly time is allotted for physical education for every class, whether for physical education teacher there are separate teachers, any other teachers or no teachers, whether playgrounds and sports equipments are available and so on. Uh, there is also data on distribution of language and math textbooks. Uh, then there is uh, data about distribution of uniforms, annual composite grant and so on. So, over the years uh, since 2005, the design of ASAR surveys have mostly uh, stayed the same, but the core tools regarding the reading and arithmetic assessments have uh, remained the same. Additional tools and modules have been added and removed depending upon which aspect of education ASAR wanted to focus that year. Uh, now, there has been some evolution of design. For example, in 2006, basic data about children aged 3 to 6 was gathered. In 2007, questions on household assets were added. In 2009, questions regarding father's basic education were added. In 2010, bonus tools for everyday maths task was added. In 2011, monitoring and recheck mechanisms were put in place. In 2014, questions about school management committees and school development plans were included. And from 2014 onwards, ASAR became a biennial survey instead of an annual one. And in the gap years, ASAR began to publish various focus area surveys. For example, in 2017, they focused on children in the age group of 14 to 18 years. And in 2019, the focus was on children in 4 to 8 years age group titled early years. There are uh, the component on village information gives us information about private schools, government schools, anganwadis, uh, the existence of banks, post office, electricity connection, pakka roads to villages, private health clinics, uh, computer center, government primary center and sub health centers, PDS shops, solar energy equipment, ASHA volunteers and so on. Household information provides us information on types of houses, electricity connection, newspaper, reading material available, motorized vehicles available, smartphones, internet access, uh, DVD, VCD player, domestic animals. There is also information on number of household members who eat from the same kitchen, household members who can use computer, household members who have completed class 12th and so on. 
and some of the child information domains that covered includes enrollment status, tuition status, tuition fees, uh, school attendance in the last one week, assessments on foundational reading, foundational arithmetic, um, then reading comprehension, word problems, writing and so on. And with regard to parents information, we have uh, parents age and education, uh, mother's uh, mobile test, the ability to dial a number, whether a mother's education influences child's education or not can also be uh, found from these uh, data sets. There is also various kinds of school information that has gone into these ASAR surveys that provides us very rich information. Now, let me uh, sort of try and uh, show you that how um, we have uh, looked at learning losses based upon data over the years. So, these are three tables uh, that uh, from 2005, 2014 and 2022. If you look at the uh, first column here which shows that children who cannot even read a letter uh, in class 3 for example, there are 8 percent who cannot read a letter in uh, 2005, 14 percent who cannot read a letter in 2014 and a similar percentage in 2022. Uh, whereas, in class 8, the numbers seem to have come down 1.5 percent in 2005, 1.8 percent in 2014 and uh, 2.5 percent in 2022. But the numbers are more or less similar. So, while a lot of uh, uh, progress has been made with regard to enrollments and attendance, we do see that even after many years of uh, uh, continuing education in India where we have brought in developments in processes and outcomes and so on, the learning gaps persist and therefore, there is a lot of policy attention that is required to learning losses among children who are attending schools. So, now let me uh, sort of conclude this lesson by looking at some of the key findings from ASARS over the years, uh, from the various reports over the years. Uh, with regard to basic literacy and numeracy, ASAR reports have consistently showed that a significant percentage of children in rural India uh, lack basic reading and arithmetic skills. For example, a large number of children in grade 5 often struggle to read texts meant for grade 2 levels. Many children in higher grades are unable to read simple sentences in their native languages and the percentage of children who can read at grade level often stagnates or shows very slow improvement over the years. With regard to basic arithmetic such as performing simple subtraction or division, it is a major area of concern among Indian schools. Many students in higher grades are unable to solve basic mathematical problems that are expected at lower grades. With regard to enrollments, enrollment rates for children above uh, aged 6 to 14 years have consistently been high and they are above 95 percent indicating almost universal access to schooling even in rural areas. There is a decline in out of school children, percentage of out of school children has decreased significantly over the years, but there are of course disparities uh, by so states and socioeconomic groups. There has been a substantial improvement in girls enrollment in schools with the gap between boys and girls reducing significantly over the years. While enrollment is nearly equal, girls are seen to be often performing slightly better than boys in reading skills, but the gap in arithmetic performance is minimal. Uh, with regard to school infrastructure, we see that there have been improvements over time including availability of toilets, drinking water and better classroom conditions, but disparities persist across different states. With regard to teacher attendance and pupil teacher ratio, teacher attendance remains a concern, but pupil teacher ratios have improved. Many schools still face shortages of qualified teachers. With regard to private versus government schools, we see that children in private schools tend to perform better in reading and arithmetic compared to those in government schools, although the gap is not always very large. And there has been a gradual increase in enrollment in private schools, particularly in rural areas, driven by perceived better quality of education in private schools. There has been a significant impact of COVID-19. Recent ASAR reports, uh, especially those conducted during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, have highlighted significant learning losses due to prolonged school closures and many children have regressed in their reading and arithmetic skills. There is a digital divide pandemic revealed the deep digital divide in rural India with limited access to digital devices and the internet which affected students ability to engage in remote learning. 
The focus on early childhood education, Asar tells us that enrollment in Anganwadis and other preschool facilities remains high, but quality of early childhood education is inconsistent and Asar reports have begun to focus more on early childhood education, emphasizing the importance of readiness for formal schooling. Uh, there is uh, community and parental involvement, there is a strong correlation between educational level of parents, particularly mothers and the learning outcomes of children and the role of home learning environment including access to books and support for homework is critical for improving learning outcomes. There are state variations, Asar reports highlight considerable variation in learning outcomes across different states with states like Kerala and Himachal Pradesh often performing better while states like Bihar and UP lag behind and there are states that have implemented targeted educational reforms and policies and they seem to be showing better performance in Asar findings. Uh, there is uh, a role of supplementary learning support particularly in the sense of private tutoring. There has been a noticeable increase in number of children receiving private tutoring reflecting concerns about quality of education in schools. Asar reports also document the rise of community based learning initiatives particularly in response to the gaps exposed by the pandemic. So, to conclude this lesson what we have seen today is about the uh, problem of learning crisis in, uh, the, in education and while we talk about uh, investments in education, uh, public sector investments or private sector investments while the larger debate exists with regard to uh, participation of players in the education sector, uh, but an important aspect of understanding the economics of education and the impact it has on overall growth and development is with regard to learning losses or learning crisis. So, we paid uh, some attention to the idea of learning crisis, what learning crisis refers to and how the problem of learning crisis has been addressed by community participation, community led service in India such as the annual status of education report. I hope the learnings from this lesson many of you would be provoked to look into the Asar reports and utilize the outcomes from the Asar report into your uh, research findings. Uh, so, these are a few uh, materials that I have used for uh, this study, the various Asar reports from 2005 to 2022, uh, Rukmini Banerjee's uh, papers on uh, the annual status of education report. Uh, we have also listened to some of the podcasts uh, by Rukmini Banerjee and a few other writings in the area of learning society and learning crisis. So, with this uh, concluding remark, let me end today's lesson here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.